Hey everyone, welcome to the May 6th replacement lecture for Political Science 101 at Mesa College in spring 2019. Thank you again for helping me out with this move. Um, and sorry for posting this um, a little bit late for class. No childcare and no internet make it tough to record long internet lectures. Okay, so right off the gate, um, those of you who are in the 9.30 a.m. class will notice that we're starting right at the beginning. If you don't feel like you need the review for the next five or six minutes worth of lecture, just skip it. Everyone else, um, this is right where we left off. So the lectures for this week, I'm going to split them into two or three parts. I guess at this point I don't know how long it'll take me to get through some of the content. Um, the point here is to get through some of the variation in the ways that democracies run. There are a lot of different ways that uh, democracies express themselves, different rules for voting, different rules for splitting up powers, and we're going to talk a little bit about those different voting rules and different rules for splitting up powers in those lectures. So the goals for this lecture then include seeing institutional choices as variables. So the voting rules that we have, the, the division of powers that we have, are all institutional choices, ways that we can divide up power among democratic bodies or divide up power among the voters in a democracy. And we might see those things as a dependent variable. We might ask why certain elect electoral rules get chosen. Why do certain publics choose first past the post versus proportional representation voting systems? Uh, we might ask why some places have more robust freedom of speech than others. We might ask why some places have presidents and others have prime ministers. We also want to think about these institutional choices as an independent variable. How, do, how does it change the policy outcomes that we all experience in our country if we shift from having a prime minister to a president? How does increasing the extent to which we can all enjoy freedom of speech or freedom of assembly or freedom of religion change electoral outcomes, these sorts of questions. In addition to seeing institutional choices as variables, we should start to look at how institutional choices are responses to interests or preferences. What explains the demographics within a state, uh, the preferences of different demographics within a state for different rules, right? Why do some people prefer certain institutions over others? Why do some people prefer certain policies over others? And then lastly, we want to look at institutions as responses to coordination problems, right? We've talked about market failure games now um, at length in class. And so we might ask ourselves whether institutions like proportional representation or first past the post voting or uh, parliamentary versus presidential systems of government, whether constrained media freedom or extreme media freedom are best practices for solving certain market coordination failures. Okay, so to start off, we'd like to think about the process of electing policymakers, making policies, as being something of a cycle. And at each step in this cycle, there are institutions. So for simplicity, let's say that the content of our policy, the policies that we make, is our ultimate dependent variable. What does this DV mean? What are we trying to explain if policy is the ultimate DV? And if policy is the ultimate DV, we can see institutions at every link in this chain and how they will have an effect on policy through the mechanisms that are on the slide. So the first thing that we care about is how people react to the policy that they experience. How are they affected by the rules governing who can organize? How do the rules reward different social groups for organizing? What is the structure of the media? For example, what do people say has changed about the political world since Facebook? Um, the upshot here is that people really care about how they organize and how they decide on a pre-election agenda. So in this first step here, you have people who experience policy outcomes and they decide to aggregate interests. They meet up with people who have similar interests to them, uh, and they find ways to express those interests and come to understand who in the democracy shares those interests. 
Similarly, you might guess that rules about who votes and when they get to vote might have an impact on which people actually get elected. So once we have interest aggregation, once we have demographics in a democracy that recognize similarity of interest, um, then they need to vote. They need to find ways to express those interests in terms of electoral outcomes. And the rules that we have about who's allowed to vote, when they're allowed to vote, how the votes are aggregated into positions within a democracy become extremely important for explaining policy outcomes. And then finally, there are responsibilities for every job to which we elect people and how those positions are allowed to use their power to determine which offices get to make which kinds of policy and then maybe which constituents are the most dangerous for re-election, right? So we want to be thinking about how power is split among policymakers and how that split in power might change what policies we experience. So for this we're talking about whether or not we have federalism, which we'll talk about in great detail later. Whether we have a parliamentary regime or a presidential regime is very important here. How powers are split up, those are all important. Okay. So to kick off with a question we maybe should have started the semester with, according to Strom and his co-authors, what are politics in the first place, right? Politics, the study of politics, the things that we care about when it comes to state and institutional power are decisions that are public and authoritative. So to start off with, Strom and his co-authors consider what sorts of policies we might consider to be legitimate uses of public authority, legitimate uses of the state's right to commit violence. And there are a handful of different um, handful of different policy arenas in which Strom et al. argue that states have the right to create policy. The first is building a nation. It's important when we think about this to recognize the difference between a state and a nation. A state, as we discussed in the last lecture, is a geographically bounded area controlled by a single federal government. So you think about the state as being the territory that is controlled and the set of institutions that control it. And again, we've talked about how the state is a relatively stable concept, right? The state of France has existed for many, many hundreds of years, even though the specific institutions that govern the people that live in France and the geography that has kind of been the boundary of France for a long time is more or less stable. A nation, on the other hand, is an imagined community. It's a group of people that feel a particular social kinship and a common political destiny. So now, you know, we might wonder, what is it? If a state is supposed to build a nation, what are the things that build a nation? What are the things that cause people to imagine that they belong to a community full of people that they've never met? A handful of obvious answers that you probably are aware of from just living in the world. The first and probably most common is ethnicity. There's sort of a fictional belief that there are common biological ancestors to different groups of people. Some of us are Polish, some of us are French, some of us are Indian, some of us are Twi, some of us are Teke, um, some of us are Sri Lankan or Tamil or you know any number of other ethnicities. And we believe, falsely, as it turns out the research shows, we believe that these ethnicities are built from common biological ancestors. And this feeling of common ethnicity is uh, a normal or common way to build a sense of nation. Members of a nation with people who share ethnicity. Similarly true with language and religion. Language tends to build nations in the sense that we experience common literatures. We see uh, common events through the same sort of lens because we share a language and so we share exposure to journalism and literature that way. Religion because we have common values and traditions. Um, and then lastly, a common element of statehood, or I'm sorry, a common element of nationhood occurs when a community of people shares a state. Right? So where we have ethnicity, language, and religion, we think that these um, we think that these characteristics give us a set of common experiences that cause us to care about the future 
or fate of people who share those language, religions, and ethnicities with us, even though we've never met them. States have a similar power, right? Because we all are citizens of the United States, we experience common political outcomes. If you doubt this, think for a second, no matter who you supported in the 2016 elections, how traumatic that election was for our country. Think about 9-11. Um, as another potential event, right? Like people felt American on that day because somehow, or they feel American when they think about those events because somehow we have a sense that there's a common experience that we've shared. Okay, so we can think about states and nations as having different levels of fusion. So for example, Japan is a nation and a state. Pretty much everyone who lives in Japan speaks Japanese. They consider themselves ethnically Japanese. They share one of the two major religions, uh, Buddhism or Shinto. And then um, because there's this fusion, Japan doesn't need to spend a lot of energy creating a nation out of its public. Spain, you might see as a slightly different example, right? There are a handful of ethnicities or language groups in Spain that don't feel particularly Spanish, the Basques, the Catalans don't feel as though they belong to the nation of Spain, even though they're part of Spain's state. So Spain may have some amount of way to go to build a nation out of their diverse populations. And the United States is an example of a place that attempts on its best days, on the days that it really lives up to its values. The United States attempts to build a nation out of a great diversity of ethnicities, languages, and religions. And the, the idea here, um, the articulation of the American nation is some common political experience, some common patriotism and love of country that causes whoever comes here to engage in a very civic, political, state-oriented nationalism. Samuel Huntington, who wrote The Clash of Civilizations, wrote another famous book called Who We Are, in which he made the argument that anyone who is willing to come to the United States and learn English and engage in a sort of what he calls secular Protestant work ethic is welcome to become a part of the American nation. Now, we might quibble about the extent to which Huntington's definition of American nationalism might engage in some amount of racism or prejudice, and we can certainly discuss the extent to which America actually lives up to this ideal, to the extent that we think that that's idealistic. But this is the, this is the nationalist project in the United States. And finally, we have places like Nigeria that are expressly multinational states, um, common to African countries and Middle Eastern countries that were carved up on the whim of colonial powers in Europe, many, many ethnicities were sort of forced to join, either they were cut in half by national boundaries for starters, and then forced to join these countries. And it's pretty common to talk to people in these places and hear that they are first and foremost members of their religion or ethnicity, and then secondarily members of their country. So places like Nigeria, states like Nigeria have a lot of work in front of them to build a nation, some sort of civic nation, out of the diverse ethnic, linguistic, and religious traditions in their country. Okay, so in addition to building a nation, another potential legitimate use of public authority is fostering economic growth or development. And this is a what this is a a type of authority that offers wide latitude to states. So for example, the editors share that there is a relationship between education and wealth. Now remember, this might be problematic, right? The authors are assuming that there's causation here. The more educated you are, the more wealthy you are. But of course, it's possible that this is reverse causation. It's possible that being wealthier makes you better educated. We don't need to be out in the fields working, and so we have more time to develop our human capital. It's also possible that some third variable, like democracy, encourages us to be more educated and more wealthy. Something about living in a democratic nation um, makes it more likely that we'll get an education and also makes it more likely that we'll become rich. So uh, 
That being said, if we take the author's assumption at its word that education causes economic development, then it is a legitimate use of public authority for a state to create a public education system that furthers this goal of economic development. Now notice that the authors are not urging you to accept the conclusion that education causes economic growth. You may believe that education is somehow morally or politically not the correct um, responsibility of the state. You know, libertarians don't think that people's taxes should be paying for the education of other people's children. All that Strom and his co-authors are arguing here is that any policy that is rationally related to economic growth, if the democratic um, public agrees that they believe that that policy will foster economic growth, then that's a legitimate use of public authority. So a handful of other things that matter for economic development in addition to straight up growth, according to Strom and his co-authors, um, Inequality, the state has the moral authority to manage inequality in the way that the electorate agrees to manage it. The state has the right to manage environmental damage that comes from economic growth. How do we manage the global commons? How do we manage the environmental capital that's required to, to grow an economy? And then lastly, we want to make sure that the market has fair access, that, that, there, that there's a way in which the market guarantees equal opportunity for all people. These are all part of fostering economic development. It's not just straight up growth, it's making sure that the economy functions for everyone to the extent that a democratic public agrees on the way in which economic development is fostered. That is a legitimate use of public authority. The state has the right to protect human rights. It has the right to engage in policies that protect um, natural human rights. It has the right to use its public authority to provide security, and that means both policing relations among citizens and also taking care of external threats, so you have an army and a police force. And then lastly, sort of a catch-all category, social justice and welfare. So particularly fostering economic growth and social justice and welfare seem like pretty wide scopes for what the state should be morally allowed to do with the agreement of their democratic population. So what isn't the state allowed to do? What things are illegitimate uses of public authority, according to the authors today? Well, there are four things that stand out to them. One is the destruction of natural communities. So notice um, the tension this stands in with creating a nation. One of the ways that the United States has attempted to create a nation in its past. Um, is to do things like murder the indigenous population, right? Much, much easier to create a sort of European, um, you know, maybe, maybe agnostic Christian identity if you've purged all of the people who speak native languages and are of native beliefs. Slavery and the forced Christianity or conversion to Christianity and English of slave populations in the United States. Another example of the U.S. attempting to build a nation by destroying natural communities. So to the extent that a country or a state, I'm sorry, destroys natural communities in order to build a nation, that's seen as being an illegitimate use of power. Obviously then violation of human rights is illegitimate, over-regulation and inefficiency in the market, and exploitation and unfair use of force. Now one thing that you want to notice right away is that there are good faith debates between Republicans and Democrats in the United States over, for example, what constitutes overregulation of the economy to an inefficiency that accrues an inefficiency to economic growth. So part of the reason that politics becomes contentious and moral is that Republicans will claim that some of the intrusion that Democrats favor into the economy constitutes an overregulation and an inefficiency and is therefore outside of the moral authority of the state. Whereas Democrats will typically argue that these policies either affect some form of social justice or allow for some form of broad economic development. And so as a result of this debate over the empirical effect of the policy, the factual effect of the policy, 
there's a moral disagreement left over between the parties. So at the very beginning of the class, when I talked about how this was a class about what you can prove, not what you believe, here's a circumstance in which, to some extent, what you can prove about the effect of a certain policy, about the effect of taxing someone and taking their money and using that money to fund a certain social program or redistribution program, really leads in terms of whether or not you think that the policy is moral or not. Now, from, from the perspective of Strom and his co-authors, the extent to which a policy is actually managing the efficient growth of the economy or delivering on some sort of social welfare goal is, is the deciding factor in whether or not that is a moral use of public authority. So, in order to understand how states pursue these purposes and when they overreach, we have to start thinking about how institutions, the design of the government, works as a potential avenue to reach or overreach on these goals. So we might think about it, you know, in the, in the way that we have before, thinking about independent variables and dependent variables, right? Say that our ultimate dependent variable is policy outcomes here, and we have some number of independent variables. We have the ways in which people in a country, in a democracy, are allowed to aggregate their interests, to whom they may speak, when they may engage in political speak, speech, when they may not, um, what sorts of donations, uh, what sorts of interest groups and lobbying groups are legal. All of these sorts of independent variables refer to interest aggregation. We'll talk about this in much greater detail coming up. And they may have an effect on policy outcomes. Similarly, electoral rules, who is allowed to vote and when, may have an independent effect on policy outcomes. And then lastly, the separation of powers, the institutions that decide who in the government is allowed to make which rules at what times may have an effect on policy outcomes, right? If the president is not allowed to author legislation in one country, but is allowed to author legislation in another, then we might think that the, the country in which the president is allowed to author legislation may have different policy outcomes than the country in which the president is not allowed to author legislation independently. Okay, so one potential uh, major difference in uh, the types of government that we have is whether we have a majoritarian or consociational democracy. So what do majoritarian and consociational democracy mean? The distinction here is in how much power we give to the majority. Now notice that there is a moral tension here, right? The purpose of a democracy is to let voters choose what happens in their country. If we give too much power to the minority, it frustrates democracy. We need to allow the majority to make some decision, but at the same time, majorities really have a tendency to run over the human or democratic rights of minorities when they're given too much power. So there's a balance, there's a balancing act that needs to be made here between powers offered to majorities and powers offered to minorities. Okay, so one way to categorize the nearly infinite variation in democratic practice is to ask about the extent to which the country trades off efficiency for participation. Um, Here's how majoritarian regimes work. Majoritarian regimes vest power in one party per branch of government. Minorities have the right to object uh, and under certain circumstances veto legislation, but they can't control the agenda. There are constitutional constraints against, um, against majoritarian rule. So in the United States, you might think about the Electoral College and the Senate and the filibuster as being moments in time at which the minority might be able to object. We don't think about this very much, um, to put it in these terms in American politics, but the fact that places like Wyoming and Iowa and North Dakota and South Dakota have more electoral college votes, that's actually the minority of our country objecting to rule by the Democrats, right? The minority has certain rights to object to rule by Democrats and the way that that expresses itself in our democracy is that it, it functionally gives the, the rule through the presidency to the minority. 
Okay. So, we remember these nested rules from our Ostrom lecture, right? Let's go through them in a little bit more detail now. Operational rules in a majoritarian system are firmly in the grasp of the majority. These are the rules that discuss how we manage day-to-day -day resources. These are speed limits, these are tax rates, these are what it, the distinctions between manslaughter and premeditated murder. Operational rules are the, the rules that you think about the legislature passing and the governor or the president um, approving or attempting to veto. So we think in a majoritarian system, what we tend to see is that the operational rules are in strong majority control. It's very, very difficult for the minority to object to operational rules in any meaningful way. The majority gets their way here. You still have majority control over electoral rules and policy, and this is true in the United States as well. Think about how gerrymandering or voter rights work. The party that's in charge typically gets to make these rules, right? If the Republicans are in charge for long enough or the Democrats are in charge for long enough, they, they essentially get to draw the electoral districts. And over time, we see that those electoral districts come to favor the party that's in power. But when it comes to institutional or constitutional rules, we see that there are cross or counter majoritarian checks. So it's very difficult, for example, for the majority to change constitutional rules. In the United States, you need three-quarter majorities in the House and the Senate, or you need three-quarters of all state legislators to ratify an amendment to the Constitution. This means that minorities, at least large minorities, any minority over 25% 20, of the population, has a really easy route to, um, to block a constitutional amendment. And changes in you know what powers the president has or what powers the legislature has that are not constitutional are similarly difficult to change. Probably not as difficult as a constitutional rule, but but difficult to change. Okay, so if this is how a majoritarian institution looks, or this is how a majoritarian government works, what does a consociational government look like? Well, first we have mutual vetoes. So there are certain percentages of the population, or maybe certain underprivileged groups, that are, of, that are allowed to veto an operational rule unless a supermajority overrules it. So we have to build massive coalitions, right? We need to build grand coalitions between parties or between constituencies, between minority and majority groups in order to pass laws. We also typically have proportional representation, which is um, a different voting system that we'll take a look at a little bit later in the lecture. Federalism is pretty common in consociational regimes. We'll talk a lot about federalism in the coming slides. And then lastly, we tend to think that consociational democracies sacrifice efficiency. Right? It, you know, the, the United States is typically seen as a more or less majoritarian um, more or less majoritarian system, and we may say to ourselves, oh, well, this is characterized by gridlock, so what efficiency are we sacrificing here? What are we really talking about? Well, for example, Belgium is seen as one of the most consociational democracies of, in the developed world, and they've essentially been without a government for the past 10 years. They, they've been unable to elect a government that has any sort of majority. They've been unable to build a grand coalition that's capable of passing laws. And so Belgium has essentially been operating on the same operational rules, the same electoral rules for the past 10 years, because no one can get anything through. That's pretty massive gridlock. Okay, these slides are somehow out of order. Oh, no, they're not. Never mind. Um, okay, so now we're going to get into a little bit more um, each of these columns in order, and we'll start with the interest aggregator. So one possibility is that policy outcomes are influenced by institutions or the rules of how people are allowed to interact with each other in the state, right? So we divide these into, so we can, we can start thinking about an interest aggregator specifically. What are the rules of interest aggregation in a society? Okay, so let's take one example market here. What does interest aggregation really mean? We might think about how agri agricultural policy is formed as being primarily about farmers, 
right? The farmers are the ones who care most about agricultural policy. But in addition to the farmers, governments face pressure from food consumers, people who are buying the output of the farmers. They face pressure from environmental groups who want better land use from farmers. Bankers that participate in the agricultural sector, manufacturers of agricultural technology and capital, and a number of others. All policy markets have buyers and sellers and webs of complex interests. So how do these groups represent themselves? Who gets heard and who gets drowned out? Strom and his co-authors list a handful of potential interest aggregation setups, right? These are the basic types of networks that function to connect people to the power of government. So let's, uh, let's go through them. But first, let's talk a little bit more generally about the exchange that occurs between a network of people that have an interest in how the government runs um, and, and the government itself or members of parties who hope to take power in a government. This relationship can be characterized in two major ways. In programmatic or bottom-up relationships, bottom-up pro programmatic we see here, citizens exchange donations and policy demands and volunteer labor for a coherent platform and a slate of candidates that support some core set of planks within that platform. So what we see is that the citizens are providing some amount of volunteer labor and policy demand and in exchange what they're getting is a party that is coordinated around a core set of interests. Now notice that what counts as a core set of interests, what makes a particular candidate electable within a party varies quite a bit. You know, you think today about the Democratic Party, it's a big tent party. Um, lots and lots of Democrats or people who run and win as Democrats have beliefs about certain policies that run counter to the mainstream Democratic Party. So for example, counter, Connor Lamb, who's in the 12th district of Pennsylvania, is notably pro-gun. Uh, we have some blue dog Democrats that continue to be uh, pro-life. So under certain circumstances, the party is willing to sacrifice some planks of the platform in order to get someone who is willing to um, support most of the party's platform. So we call this programmatic politics. And so what usually happens here in a programmatic world is that it doesn't matter which party gets elected. All citizens in the country are then entitled to the same set of rights and welfare, right? So it doesn't matter if you voted for a Republican um, who wanted to cut some social funding. If you then decide that you need that funding or you want to avail yourself of that social program, you're allowed to do so. And the fact that you voted Republican doesn't prevent you from accessing that resource or that policy. That's really distinct from top-down or patronage networks, where citizens exchange this unwavering style of political support for selective benefits and favoritism. So in this circumstance, what we see is that who you vote for is what gets you into the circle of people who's allowed to partake in the welfare program. So in this circumstance, you know, in taking the U.S. example, if a Republican voter wanted to avail themselves of unemployment insurance and a Democrat was in power, the Democrat would specifically deny the right of that Republican voter um, to access those welfare systems because that Republican voter had voted against the person who's now the patron. Typically where we see this, there's some sort of religious or sectarian or ethnic dimension to the patronage. Um, if you are the member of a particular ethnicity or religion, and your ethnicity or religious party is in charge, then you get selective access to benefits. You get favoritism. And as a result, there is an incentive for every person um, to vote for the party of their ethnicity or religion. It used to be the case. We'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit greater detail later. Oh, no, actually, we already talked about it. We, we talked about it last week. We talked about circumstances where this wasn't true. But it used to be the case that we talked about African elections as being like a census right? Whichever group of ethnicities that were banded together had the highest population, that was the party that would take power in that region. 
Uh, that's, that's no longer the case, as we saw in the example of Botswana and Ghana. Uh, there are other places in Africa that are developing more robust democracies like Kenya. And so the ethnic relationship to parties is breaking down, and it's, it's less patronage and more programmatic. But this is what we call patronage politics. This is, um, this is a pretty important distinction for political science, probably a pretty important distinction for the final exam. Um, so if you're going forward into a four-year program where you're thinking about social sciences or you're nervous about the way that I've explained this for the exam, this is something you really want to ask questions about when we come back next week. Okay, so this is a table from Strom et al. And as we can see, states feature different combinations of interest aggregating institutions. So of course, each of these examples will work differently, right? The fact that some places have patron-client networks, some places have competitive parties, uh, some places have military uh, military parties. We see that, you know, for example, in China, the military has a really high influence over politics, where in the United States it does not. These are potential independent variables. Where the military has a lot of political power, we might expect to see different political outcomes than where it has no power. Where patron-client networks are particularly strong, we might, accept, we might expect to see um, one type of policy outcome where we wouldn't expect to see that in places where patron-client networks are extremely rare. So for example, being the member of the right party through your ethnicity, through your religion in places like India and Iran is extremely important, whereas in the United States, voting Republican or Democrat has very little effect on what social services you as an individual um, get to experience. Now notice that this sets up something of a collective action problem, right? You can vote for Republicans to lower your taxes and then still avail yourself of welfare if it turns out that we have higher taxes and a stronger welfare state. Okay, so another way to think about these interest aggregators as potential independent variables, right? You could have each of these might be its own each country might have its own sort of unique combination, or there might be groups of countries that have similar combinations of interest aggregating groups that exist in their societies. And we might think about whether that combination of interest aggregators matters. If you have a military institution that's interacting with a competitive party, how is that different than when a military institution interacts with an authoritarian party? How does that affect what sorts of public policy outcomes we expect? Uh, we might also ask whether a particular interest aggregation system exists. Is there a military party? Is there freedom of speech? Is there freedom of association? What effect does that have on our policy outcome dependent variable? Okay, so let's run through a handful of these interest aggregation um, interest aggregation institutions, and then we'll probably call it a day for this particular lecture. Okay, patron-client networks. Uh, we talked about these already. Patron-client networks occur when some particular individual has access to a state resource, and then they auction that access off. So where you have a, uh, a government official who has access to state jobs or who has access to providing welfare benefits or social services in a particular community, then they auction that access off to the highest bidder. Typically, the bids are for civilian support in future elections. What the patron really wants is to stay in power so that they can keep their hands on the levers of power. Um, so examples of this might include a state senator finding jobs for a constituent. It might include people who can influence judges. It might include directing aid to constituents who are members of the Republican or Democratic Party or to people who otherwise publicly support the candidacy, right? Like you take down the names of businesses that have Mitt Romney's sign out front and then if Mitt Romney is elected president, um, you know, he will only provide tax breaks to those businesses. Mitt Romney's probably a bad example, maybe the least corrupt um, person ever to run in, in American history, but you get the idea. Um, associational groups are probably a little bit more familiar to American politics. These are organized by an entrepreneur that sells membership to the associational group on the grounds that the associational group will produce policies that benefit the interests of its members. 
So we've talked about this before in terms of the collective action problem, right? We wondered how it is that certain groups are capable of representing themselves to the government, how certain lobbying groups form. When we think about associational groups, what we typically think about are groups like the AARP or the NRA or the NAACP. These are the groups that have overcome the collective action problem, typically by offering some sort of selective incentive, right? The AARP and the NRA both have their own credit cards. Um, they have their own hotel discounts. They have their own magazines that you get as a side benefit. And the true purpose of the business, though, is to create legislation that benefits retired people or gun owners. Um, okay, military parties. The reason that military parties are so important to understanding how democracies function, I guess I shouldn't say military parties, the military in general. Um, the reason the military is important is that the military has stable policy preferences and they're interested in policies that help maintain the power and influence of the military, their parochial interest in maintaining their own power um, indefinitely. And so militaries have these stable interests and so we think about how the military functions relative to the government is being very important. Now in the United States, the idea here is that the military is entirely subsumed under civilian control, but that's not always true in practice and in principle. Um, and the military is dangerous not only because it has stable preferences, or interesting not only because it has stable preferences, but also because it's the violent arm of the state. So if the military doesn't like what's happening in a democracy, they always have the option to engage in a coup. And so the military wields, in most countries, disproportionate influence over domestic politics. Even in the United States, we see this happen sometimes, right? In the case of Worcester versus Virginia, uh, Georgia, <laughs> Worcester versus Georgia, this is the case that gave sovereignty rights to Native American tribes. Um, the Supreme Court held that Native American tribes that existed here before the colonists came to the United States had sovereignty, which meant that the United States could not engage in violence against members of Native American tribes without declaring war. And war, of course, especially at this point in time when Andrew Jackson was president, actually required the consent of Congress. Um, through a monkey wrench in Andrew Jackson's plans to relocate Native American tribes to reservations far, far away from their homelands. Uh, when Jackson was creating the policies that led to the Trail of Tears, several secretaries of state in the United States sued the federal government in order, for, in order to get a declaratory action that these um, Native American tribes were sovereign and that the president lacked the power to engage in war against these tribes, and the court said that they were right. But Jackson ignored the ruling. He ignored the ruling, and he mocked the court's inability to back its edicts with force, and he continued to resettle American tribes despite the fact that the, uh, the Supreme Court had expressly forbade it. So the military can decide when to use its power and when not to use its power, when maybe it ought to. Political parties are also very important. Obviously, competitive political parties are central to the function of any democracy. Uh, a number of political scientists, including the authors of today's assignment, have demonstrated empirically that without political parties fulfilling three roles, democracy is functionally unworkable. And here are the three roles. Uh, first, competitive parties combine party member interests and set an agenda. So they take the temperature of the party's members, decide which policy priorities are the most important to the party, on which the party is most unified. Uh, and they, they set an agenda, they set a policy platform. Second, they sponsor and coordinate election strategy with voters. So they tell the voters which candidates meet the party's approval and how and why. Uh, they sponsor particular candidates. Candidates receive endorsements from political parties. And that's one of the ways that voters know that that candidate supports the policy platform that the party agreed upon as closely as possible while still being capable of winning an election in the district at hand.
Then the third thing that parties do, once members of the party have been elected, is that they implement party discipline in service of the party's agenda. They make sure that members of the party don't wander too far from the platform. And if they do, they punish them by withholding re-election funds, by withholding future endorsements, uh, by publicizing the treason of that particular member. Now notice it's in the best interest of the competitive party to occasionally allow certain members of the party to wander, right? Uh, we talked about Connor Lamb before. No Democratic um, grandee in their right mind is going to punish Connor Lamb for voting pro-gun rights. They know that the only way that they get Connor Lamb to represent Pennsylvania's 12th is to, um, is to make sure that he can vote pro-gun. So they hold the feet to the fire where it's reasonable and rational to do so, and not otherwise. Um, because competitive parties are so important, um, and because we're discussing democracy for such a short time, let's dig into the problem of parties really quick. So parties, because they exert this type of control over interest aggregation, um, they run into a particular problem. There's a tension between party democracy and party oligarchy. Parties need to choose how to select candidates and the agenda, and they have two options. The first is party democracy. This requires the party to be ultimately responsive to voters. This is where you have primary elections that really matter. Um, or we can choose party oligarchy, right? Party oligarchy affords greater control of the party's agenda to those who donate the most money or the most time, the activists in the party. And the activist votes get to outweigh the votes of the party members. Now, it may seem like party oligarchy is the wrong way to go. We should have one person, one vote. But the problem is that for the party, the problem is that if you alienate the very people who are willing to, um, who are willing to donate money and who are willing to donate time in favor of a more publicly popular policy or a more publicly popular candidate that does not inspire the volunteers or the donors, then you're stuck with a candidate who can't mobilize the resources needed to win the election. We can see this problem in a particular principle called Hotelling's problem. Um, it explains why party oligarchs tend to be centralized near, other, near the oligarchs of other parties in terms of their policy preferences, and why, why it is that popular Democratic parties are not particularly electable. So at this point, please pause this lecture, this video, and go watch the YouTube link for Hotelling's Problem, and then come back in a few minutes when you're done watching Hotelling's Problem, and we'll discuss it for a second. Okay, so plainly, we were talking about, uh, you know, we're talking about political opinions where the hotelings problem uh, video is talking about Ned and Ed's ice cream bars. But the problem for parties here and the pressure for oligarchy is somewhat the same, right? If you will, if the Democrats or the Republicans allow themselves to get pulled too far leftward or rightward along the policy beach, it allows the other party that's dominated by an oligarchy that can act strategically in response to the popular whims of the other party to take over portions of the beach that shouldn't really belong to it, right? This happens when Ed moves to the north three-quarter mark of the beach, uh, and then Ed can move up right behind him. And everyone to Ed's south has to go to Ed, and still Ed is capturing some number of customers to his north. So because of this, it almost doesn't matter what the parties want democratically or publicly, the only way for the parties to win is by fortifying themselves at the very center of the beach. And we can talk a little bit about how I think this is transitioning in American politics when we're back together in person next week. Okay, authoritarian parties, um, these should be pretty familiar too. They feature top-down management. They distribute the spoils from participation um, in, in government to 
the people who vote and organize activity. This is in contrast to competitive parties where the voters have the resources, even if they're disaggregated, um, which requires the parties to please the voters. So the, the distinction here between competitive and authoritarian parties, or rather competitive parties, and then we'll see authoritarian and personalistic parties, is that competitive parties tend to go hand in hand with programmatic politics, and authoritarian and personalist parties tend to go hand in hand with, um, wow, I'm blanking on it. <laughs> Amazing, just several slides ago. Uh, with patron-client politics, with, with clientelistic politics. So the authoritarian and personalist parties tend to be more clientelist and, um, and patronage-based, and the competitive parties tend to provide more programmatic politics. Authoritarian parties come in at least two types. One, you have an exclusive governing party. This is a completely totalitarian party. They ban other parties and other forms of civic engagement entirely. You belong to the party or you belong to nothing. And in a lot of cases, you essentially have to belong to the party. The most totalitarian of exclusive governing parties won't even let book clubs or soccer clubs operate without the, the blessing of the party and without the presence of a party member. Inclusive governing parties are more tolerant. They use democratic um, democratic institutions, or at least institutions with a veneer of democracy as information gathering tools or as ways to spy on their populace. Uh, and we'll talk about this at much, much greater length next week when we talk about um, why some autocracies, why some autocracies engage in elections and engage in media freedom uh, and those sorts of things. And then lastly, we have personalist regimes. These are pretty quirky, and they're probably pretty familiar. Figurehead regimes like Muammar Gaddafi's or Saddam Hussein's really become a complex for the party to, uh, to support one individual person. And so even deeper than being authoritarian, it's really entirely about supporting that individual leader. Okay. That will be all for this particular lecture. When we come back in the next video, we'll talk about election rules and we'll talk about separation of powers and how those things influence policy outcomes. All right, I will talk to you then.